Welcome, I'm Father Mitch Paquin. Welcome to Scripture and Tradition. Today, we will continue to analyze the events and the personal interactions that took place on the morning of Christ's resurrection. We'll also take a look at how the Jewish chief priests and elders tried to stifle the proclamation of the good news of the risen Christ. And we might take a look at how that compares to various cover-ups and false testimony about abusive priests, religious, and bishops uh, that we had. Now, if you have any questions related to today's topic or any comments, we invite you to be part of the show. You can do what these nice folks did, which is come and be in our live studio audience. We love having you. Or you can call during the live show, and that's between 2 and 3 p.m. on Tuesday, Eastern Time. The number you can call if you are in North America is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, you can still call, but it is country code 1, area code 205-271-2988. You can also send us an email by writing to Scripture and Tradition at EWTN.com. You can also follow us and participate with the show on YouTube. So let's continue now where we left off. We started Chapter 7 of my book, Wheat and Tares, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church. You can get this book at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC.com and it is item number 81098. We are starting today's discussion on page 174 if you already have that book. So, we were talking about Mary Magdalene and how she turned, she went to the tomb a second time. And when she's there, she doesn't notice that Jesus is standing next to her. He must have appeared in some ordinary way uh, because she easily assumes that he is the gardener. And uh, she doesn't quite know that it's Jesus, as we see there in John 20, verse 14. She didn't know it was Jesus. It could be that she didn't recognize him because she was fully expecting to see a dead Jesus. That, she was looking for a corpse. The last thing she expected was a risen Lord Jesus. And she, plus, in his glorification, he looked differently than when he was uh, in this life, before the resurrection. And the other thing, too, she's very focused on her mission to finish anointing Jesus' corpse. So she's not really looking and expecting Jesus to be there. So... It's very much just like the angels. The angels had taken the initiative to speak to the women when they came to the empty tomb. Now Jesus takes the initiative to speak to Mary Magdalene. It's not up to her. It's up to him. And um, so she uh, is still assuming that uh, he is someone, uh, or excuse me, he says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? So he's entering into her experience of grief. And notice her explanation. She responds, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. So she just wants to show the proper care for 
a, a dead body. This was a very important value among Jewish people. You see it described in great detail in the book of Tobit. And we also know about the importance of caring for the body of the dead uh, from the rabbinic writings as well. They, th this was a sign of respect and a recognition of the dignity of the body. So this is a very important thing. And at that point, Jesus speaks her name, Mary, speaks to her, and she then calls him Rabuni, which means my teacher. Now, text usually says just teacher, but in uh, Aramaic, it's my teacher. And this goes back to something we mentioned last week, the connection with the Song of Songs. Uh, we talked about how Mary Magdalene was looking for Jesus and, and recited the Song of Songs. Now I'd like to take a look at Song of Songs, chapter 3, verse 4, where, again, the beloved woman says, when I found him whom my soul loves, I held him and would not let him go. That this sense of, you know, hanging on to Jesus is connected with that verse. And she is showing the kind of love of the much beloved woman that we see in the song. Now, Jesus responds to her, Do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but I go to my, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. A very important part of telling her not to cling to him, not to hold on to him, is that he is not to stay here. It's you know, on, on earth. There's going to be something that you know, is beyond just touch. It's, he's not, remember, he, he would, we'll see later uh, on in future programs that our Lord had told Thomas, the apostle, touch the hands. But she's doing something different. She's not merely touching She's trying to hold on to him. And this is a very important thing, that we cannot hold on to Jesus, uh, that, that there's something much larger than what we see with him uh, going on here. And it's part of his mission to return to the Father. You know, we'll mention this in future programs too, but if our Lord had stayed in Jerusalem and was just walking around there. He could be there for all these thousands of years. But his task of going to be to the right hand of God the Father in heaven is extremely important because he needs to be available for everybody everywhere, that if he stayed in Jerusalem, we'd all have to go to Jerusalem to see him. If he ascends to the right hand of the Father, then he can make himself available in every time and every place. And that's a key thing here. So this is why uh, we, we see this mention you know, that she cannot cling to him. And she does not, um, you know, tell the apostles about the empty tomb this time, but she goes and tells about the resurrection. The first time she ran to the apostles, she told them that the tomb is empty. And they came to see and they checked it out and it was true. But then we also see that here she goes and proclaims the resurrection. And 
she says, I have seen the Lord. That is a different message. And it's because of this that she is typically identified as he apostole tois apostolois by the early fathers of the church. She is the female apostle. That's what apostole is. That's the female form of it. She is the apostle tois apostolois to all the apostles. She brought them the good news because of her love of Christ. She could see him and see him resurrected. And we also see another element here that by her not clinging to Jesus, it also means that she can do her mission. He does his mission of going to the Father. She does her mission of proclaiming the good news. So that's a key part here. Now, we go on and deal with more of how our Lord is dealing with this morning of the resurrection. I'd like to go, first of all, to Matthew um, and see what he says in Matthew 28, verses 8 to uh, 15. And we'll begin with verse 9. Behold, Jesus met them, that is, the women, and said, Hail. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worship him. Again, while St. John only mentions Mary Magdalene trying to hold on to Jesus, here the women as a group try to hold on to him. They, they hold on to his feet. And this is, uh, you know, another aspect. And, you know, some people try to make uh, this big clash between the two. But it's that John is focusing on Mary Magdalene because she became this prominent person who was a, uh, this, a disciple that told the apostles. Um, St. Matthew just includes her with all the women. And whether it was only Mary Magdalene or whether it was the group of women that included Mary Magdalene is something we'll have to wait and find out from them. Um, you know, if uh, we get to go to heaven, uh, we'll certainly see St. Mary Magdalene and the other holy women up there. So this is, uh, we'll have to wait for the exact details. But this is what we have in this gospel. And at this point, we see that Jesus spoke to the women and says, do not be afraid. One of the standard things that our Lord says. And I, I like to focus a little bit on that, uh, do not be afraid, because a lot of people in our culture want you to be afraid because they can manipulate you better. If you are scared of everything, they can say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll help you not be scared or I'll help save you from this. And a lot of times they don't know what they're doing either. So, you know, I, I like the way our blessed Lord says, be not afraid. Then he gives them instructions. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. And while they were go, going, behold, now we see a, a shift. Uh, they have a message to tell the apostles. Now there's a shift. Behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people. His disciples came by night and stole him while he, we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now, there are a couple things that we should notice here. Um, first of all, if the soldiers failed to, you know, to guard the, 
body and the tomb of Jesus inside, uh, the, the body of Jesus inside the tomb, um, if they failed, they could be executed. This was a very serious thing. In fact, we see in Acts of the Apostles when St. Peter escapes jail. Herod Agrippa I has those soldiers executed. That was the normal thing, you know, to do to soldiers. Uh, that kept you motivated to do your job. So that was one thing. But then th th there's a few points worth noting. One, the soldiers were willing on their own initiative to go and tell the chief priests. The women go to the apostles who are not only people that have the potential to have faith in Jesus. That, again, the apostles still have a lot of trouble believing what, that Jesus was raised up. It's not easy for them. The priests don't doubt that Jesus was raised up. They've got these soldiers who are impartial observers telling them that Jesus is raised and everything else they saw with the, the tomb and uh, the, the stone rolled away and the angels. They see all this. They re relate it. And Notice the chief priests and such don't say, you guys are nuts. You guys are on drugs. You guys are drunk or you're lying. They don't say any of that, do they? They believe them. But they don't want that story spread. That's a very important point here. And uh, this is, is something that they take counsel and notice that they treat the soldiers the same way they treated Judas Iscariot. They use a bribe. They give him money. In the case of Judas, they give him money to spill the beans on where Jesus is. In the case of the soldiers, they give a bribe in order to shut them up. They simply want to use that money to, um, you know, have their own position. And they are given instructions about the story to tell a lie. They're told a lie. Tell the people his disciples stole the body at night and that they, and they got away with it. Um, and don't worry about the government. We'll take care of him too, probably with another bribe. So this shows that even though they believe the report, in contrast to the holy women and to Mary Magdalene, who have this love by which they were looking for Jesus, these leaders try to stifle because their heart, heart has become so hardened that they prefer deceit. And remember that this is partly what they had done with Judas. Judas, in accepting the bribe, had let Satan enter him. Now, by promoting lies and deception, they are choosing to be on the side of Satan, who is, by his nature, a liar and the father of lies. They are hardening their heart to love and going on the side of the evil one. Now, this is going to be a very important point for us to consider. I want to take a break and we'll come back and look at it more in detail so that we see the meaning of this deception and the effect that it uh, has on them, but also how we might at times be able to relate to this. So please stay with us.
Okay, welcome back. Welcome back. Um, we, we're starting to talk about the high priests uh, giving a bribe to the soldiers and telling them to lie about what happened. Um, that, that's where we are at this point. And uh, a very important thing to take a look at some of the background uh, of what we've discussed uh, months ago when we talked about the trials of Jesus. Remember, these are the same people that were either in charge of the trials, like the Sanhedrin and the priests, or they were some of the soldiers that were in the trial as well. So this is something that we have to remember because when they did that, they did so with a lot of false testimony at our Lord's trial. Um, they paid a number of false witnesses. And then uh, and one of the things that was a problem with bribing false witnesses is that as is typical of liars, it's hard to keep the story straight. You know, you don't see them telling the same thing. And anybody who's had little kids, if you keep asking them questions, they keep tripping themselves up. They get caught fairly easily, um, especially if you know them and you know how to question them. And that happened to the witnesses. And then they interrogated Jesus uh, and got him to abjure by the living God that he was the son of God. And the soldiers, these, may, these soldiers may well have been part of the same detail that held Jesus when, after they arrested him. And they were mocking him, slapping him around, spitting on his face. Remember, he got hit in the face. And you even see on the Shroud of Turin that there is a swollen uh, uh, side of Jesus' face. So this is uh, another element of the priests. And, you know, now they are making new false accusations that the disciples stole the body, and that's just been taken away. And this is uh, trying to get the soldiers to testify and do the lie. Now, in Matthew 28, verse 15, we read, so they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. And it's something that is meant for Matthew to spread the, this uh, or show this difference between the evangelists who are collecting the reports of the different people and putting them together in different places. You know, they, they didn't stay in Jerusalem and sort of, all right, what, what notes do you have and compare? No, no they, you know, Mark wrote his gospel in uh, Rome. Luke came a little bit later and he wrote it partly in Israel, partly in Rome. St. Matthew probably wrote in Syria and St. John in what's now Turkey, uh, then Asia Minor. So they wrote at different times and such. And this is something that uh, we want to contrast what the evangelists said and what the, um, the, these lies told by the priests and the soldiers. And, you know, this being induced to give false witness and spread this. Now, one of the things that we can also see, though, is when we get to Acts of the Apostles, the apostles are put on trial a number of times after uh, Peter and John pray for the man who is crippled and he can walk. And then again, when they go and preach in the temple, they get arrested again. Uh, St. Stephen gets arrested in Acts chapter 7. Uh, a number of times they're arrested. Paul gets arrested later on and has to 
appear before the Sanhedrin. And it's interesting that in none of those trials do the chief priests or the Pharisees say, all right, let's just walk down to the tomb and we'll show you that the body is still there. Neither do the priests ever accuse the apostles of stealing the body. They paid that bribe to spread that story, but apparently it wasn't so believable. They did not find uh, acceptance of that story from the soldiers, and the apostles were spreading the, the gospel of Jesus. And it's interesting to me that the only argument that they use when they put the apostles on trial is stop talking about that man and stop blaming us. They don't have the ability to refute the gospel. And remember, the tomb of Jesus was only about a 15-minute walk from the temple and the Sanhedrin. I've walked it many times. It's not far, but they never, ever tried to present evidence one way or the other. They simply say, don't talk about it. And this is the absolute opposite of what the angels had told the women and what Jesus had told the women. And we have to see this contrast. That's a very important thing, especially when we have people in our own world that, you know, don't believe in the resurrection. Sometimes people raised in the church, sometimes people who've been Christian uh, deny it, but they don't have evidence. They just use supposals like, well, that can't happen. Couldn't be, it couldn't be possible. And if I can't figure out how it's possible, then it's not possible. Um, a lot of people like that. Now, I'd also like to apply this to the theme of my book, and that is trying to deal with the terrible scandals that have happened in the church. Sometimes there are still things, usually not the abuse of minors, but there are other scandals that occur among the clergy. And we should remember this scene when we think back on how in the 90s and early 2000s, it became known that some of the bishops and superiors and others were doing cover-ups. Sometimes they were uh, trying to hide the abuse done by priests. And there have been cases where they would bribe the victims to be quiet, uh, some, whether it's folks outside. Sometimes it was seminarians. Sometimes it was lay people. And they even used threats about telling the sins of, of some of these perpetrators. Um, these things happened, you know, and it's, it's a horrible thing. And it, we have to remember that this is you know, a parallel to those who inside the church deny the truth of God's commandments and then when they get caught breaking them, try to cover it up. Uh, we had a number of people, including theologians, sometimes nuns and priests and brothers and teach catechists and others, who would tell people falsehoods, saying, well, it's not really a mortal sin if you purposely miss Mass on Sunday. And, you know, if you really love somebody, it's okay that you have relations with them, even though you're not married to them or otherwise might be illicit. Uh, people were saying these things. This grew to be fairly popular in the... Uh, early 70s, and it, it was said often. And this 
when, you know, and there were some sins in past times where people would also try to justify racism, try to justify anti-Semitism, and all kinds of other things. It's easy to justify sin and, you, sin, and you can try to use the Bible to do that, uh, bringing out the fact that people oftentimes cite that even the devil can quote Scripture. And we say that because when he tempted Jesus, he was quoting Psalm 91. So, you know, this is what the evil one can do, and theologians have done the same thing. And we, it becomes a way to try to excuse, cover up, and hide moral failures. And this is something all of us have to be alert to in our own lives. That, you know, when we sin, we don't cover it up, we bring it to confession. We reveal it. And of course, the priest here in your confession can't reveal what's told, but it's between you and our Lord as you speak that out loud and then also get to hear the words of forgiveness as well as sometimes hopefully very wise advice. On the other hand, in contrast to any kind of cover-up or attempt to deny and uh, falsify things, we want to remember the commands of God we want to remember what the angels had said to go and share the good news about Jesus and the words of Jesus himself after the resurrection in Matthew 28, verse 20, when he said to all his apostles and disciples up in Galilee, observe all that I have commanded you. He didn't give us re reasons and excuses to deny, um, you know, uh, hell. And, and he didn't give us reasons and excuses to deny our sin, to say it's okay, to cover it up. No, 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 no. He calls us to confront, you know, our sins and ask for forgiveness. And to, to truly seek uh, forgiveness with full responsibility for our offense and to deal with the situations that are bad, including those of abuse in the church, these have to be confronted and not just send people to other countries and things like that. It really needs to be a full and, and, and honest uh, acceptance that when we're wrong, we're wrong and we have to act on correcting that, okay? So this is uh, kind of a finish to the section of the v various episodes in the morning of Easter. Uh, next week, we will start taking a look at the afternoon events from Easter. So we'll continue on with that. At this point, I'd like to take a look at some of your comments and questions, and I'll start off with Joan, who is in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Joan, how are you? I'm doing really good today. Good. Did, did, are you getting out there to vote? Um, yes. Good, will, good, good, good. One in, uh, today is the primary in the Commonwealth yes. of Pennsylvania. Want to get? It is. Uh, encourage everybody to, to vote. It's a part of our duty. But anyway, go ahead, Joan. What can we do for you today? Well, mine goes back a little bit to Holy Saturday. Mm -hmm. I just learned something, and I would like your clarification on it, because mm -hmm. as a member of the Legion of Mary, we do go door to door and evangelize. I know. And I like to be as well-informed because you never know what you're going to get on the other side of a door when, right. when they open it up. But this is in regard to Holy Saturday. Okay. Um, he descended to the dead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, other interpretations are he descended into hell. I know it's not the hell like a 
everlasting right. damnation and torment and fire. But right. I believe it was St. Ignatius, maybe, who referenced that there are even different levels in um, uh, Hades, Sheol, also possibly even a limbo. Mm-hmm. And I, this is a new to me, and I would like your comment on that. Sure. Because it also, in, re- in a way, relates to those who didn't have to go down there, if I'm mm-hmm. understanding it correctly, because there was Mary who called Jesus her Savior. She okay. needed to be saved, but mm-hmm. she didn't have to go to hell or any of those, and neither did right. Enoch or Elijah. Could you flesh okay. that out let's, for me? Let's take a look at this. First of all, you know, Throughout the Old Testament, there is not a lot of talk about life after death. The, uh, the, the Old Testament doesn't treat that in a lot of detail. Uh, there, there are some things said, uh, but not much. And in fact, they never say in the Old Testament that your soul goes to Sheol, but they would talk about your shadow going there. That was their standard uh, term, your shade or shadow. And this is very typical of people in the ancient world, whether it is in Greece uh, or Rome, or among the Norse people, the, the Vikings and such, and northern German people, uh, or it, and even in the uh, Old Testament, they have this idea that your shade or shadow goes to this place of the dead. In Hebrew, it was called Sheol. In um, Greek, Hades. And in Uh, the Norse and German stories, it was called Hella. Hella was just their word for Hades or Sheol. That was what they had. And this was not punishment. It was not the place of condemnation, but it certainly wasn't heaven either. Nobody wanted to go there, but it wasn't uh, the place of torment. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 20, you see that he descended, his soul went down to preach to all the dead. That's where that comes from. And uh, it's called the prison there. That's using a term for Sheol that was found in the book of Job. Job talked about Sheol being like a prison that you can get in, but you can't get out. Well, it sounds like a roach hotel, but you you can check in, but you can't check out. Um, This was their way of trying to get at a reality God had not revealed very uh, much about. And he went there to speak to all the souls that had died before his death. And this was to preach to them. And that's what St. Peter said he was doing. That's in 1 Peter 3, verses 18 to 20. He was preaching to those souls. And that's where we get that from in that passage. Okay? All right. We need to take a little break. We'll come back in a couple of minutes with more of your questions. Uh, Please stay with us. Right. 
First of all, I want to invite you to join me Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. I'll be speaking with Dr. Margaret Turek about the mystery and importance of atonement and the atonement that Jesus Christ has won for us. She'll help us better understand why, if God is love, would he send his son to suffer and die as he did? She'll also highlight the role of God the Father in the atoning mission of God the Son. So this is going to be an important discussion because we do hear people say, well, how can God be love if he sent his son to die for us? You know, that's just not right. He could have done it a better way or a different way. We'll talk about that. Okay. Well, I have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Good to have you here. You. Good to have you. One of the four commonwealths in this country. Yeah. So what is your question? Well, Father Mitch, I'm aware that the, each of the Gospels um, portrays different aspects of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And I've always been curious about the sequence of how things mm -hmm. happened. Is there any way to know that? Well, you might get a hold of my book. <laughs> one of the, that's one of the things that I tried to do is put this in as much a sequence as I know how. Um, there is a fine book, uh, it's just called The Resurrection, and it's by Durwell, D-U-R-R-W-E-L-L. -L. I don't even know if it's still in print because I got it, I read it back uh, 56 years ago. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a book that's been around a little while. Uh, but you may tr take a look at Durwell's book, um, and again, my book also will help with that. Uh, this, is, um, th this is something that will be uh, very important. Um, I, hopefully it's helpful. And we'll, be, we'll keep on going through that. That's why I'm, I start off with the morning. Next week I'll start the afternoon of the resurrection, and then the evening, and then the other appearances after that. We have another caller. We have Patricia in the great state of New York. What can we do for you, Patricia? We have another call. We have Patricia in the great state of New York. I can't quite hear. Could you repeat yes, that? Uh, good afternoon, Father Mitch. Uh, when we say the Apostles' Creed, yes. we say we believe in the resurrection of the body. Well, mm -hmm. how is the body going to be resurrected when so many people are choosing to be cremated? In fact, mm -hmm. a, a couple of years ago, a member of the clergy here. Uh, I think we lost you. I think maybe, I, I'm not sure what uh, we were going to say about that. But in terms of the resurrection, there are a number of things about our bodily resurrection that applies not only to people who are cremated, but also to people who die at sea. You know, oftentimes um, they are eaten by fish. And, you know, and there's nothing, yeah, e even at times their bones are consumed. There's certain type of very small sea critters that will do that. And many other circumstances where people who are not buried but are, their body is destroyed in a disaster by animals or all kinds of things. None of those circumstances will prevent the Lord from raising us from the dead. A little principle from science is that matter cannot be destroyed. So none of the matter that makes up a person's body can be destroyed, even if you were to find some way to further, uh, you know, dis, uh, destroy the ashes of a dead person. You still can't really destroy matter. That's, that's the principle of conservation of matter. So this is uh, the, the matter for a dead person's body, no matter how they die 
or what happens to their body after they die, none of that matter is ever lost. And our Lord will, I mean, the, the resurrection of the dead is again, not mere resuscitation of the body, but it is a glorious transformation of the body. And this is something that our Lord will accomplish uh, for all the dead who have ever, ever lived and died. Uh, so he'll, I don't know exactly how he's going to do it. Uh, we all kind of have to wait and see. But the idea that Christ's resurrection from the dead has grounded the hope for our resurrection from the dead uh, also is a reminder to us to show great respect for the dead and to show respect for the body, um, both during life and after life is over. Okay. All right. Now we have an email from Kim who lives in California. It says, uh, dear Father Mitch, something that has always perplexed me is that there seems to be a dichotomy. One doesn't have to earn God's love, and yet one must do good works in order to make it into heaven. Please help me understand the difference. Kim, this is something, it's a little lesson I learned when I was eight years old. It, it, it hit me what had happened, uh, what, what goes on with this. Um, I was eight. We had just moved from Florida back to Chicago. And I had, of course, no money. Uh, but my father gave me a dollar so that I could go buy my mother a Christmas present. Now, he, I didn't earn that dollar. I, I, I couldn't earn that. I had no way to do it, no job, no possibility of a job, nothing. So he gave that to me, but then he expected me to use it responsibly to buy as nice a present as I could have. So uh, in, since that was back in 1957, I guess, yeah, 1957, uh, I could easily have gone to the store and bought my mother 20 Hershey bars. Because <laughs> in those days, that's all they cost was a nickel. And, uh, and I, and I could have given her 20 Hershey bars knowing full well that she would be tired of Hershey bars and she let us share some of it. Okay, I could have done that. Or I could have bought her a couple Hershey bars and bought the rest for me. That would have been something for which I would have deserved a punishment for being irresponsible with what my father had given me. But I didn't. I looked and looked around. There was a, a store. This is one of the first big box stores, you know, where you go for uh, like the equivalent of Walmart back in the mid 50s uh, called Community. It was a store in, uh, in Chicago. And I went there to see if I get the best I could get for the money that I had. And I bought my mother a little cross and it had a little purple stone in the center maybe amethyst, I don't know. Uh, but if you held it up to the light and closed one eye, you could read the Our Father on the inside. I thought that was as clever as I could come up with. So I did, I had this gift from God, but then I did as good a job as I could have with the gift that I had been given. This would be an analogy of the way the Lord loves us and trusts us, but then he expects us to act responsibly and generously with the gifts he gives us. It's not so that we can keep them for ourselves, 
but rather so that we can give more to others for, with what he gives us. And of course, you know, as time goes on, the more responsible you show yourself to be, the more you might get in order to give away more. This is the kind of thing that our Lord does. And that would be a good example of why we need both good works as well as accept this is a free gift from God. Okay? And he'll judge us by what we do with others. Again, that's not just a theory, but that's what Christ teaches us. And then we also have uh, an email from uh, Moritz in California. It says, Dear Father Mitch, in the Acts of the Apostles, we hear on several occasions that the apostles went to the temple to pray or to preach. At what time did the Christian church become independent and separate from the Jewish community? Moritz from California. Well, there are a couple of stages of that. Um, the first persecution was already a problem. Um, in 30, that was in 36 A.D. in Jerusalem. And, but then Christians still were going to the temple. We see, for instance, that um, St. Paul uh, still goes to the temple, and the other Christians are in the temple, uh, even in the 50s. The second stage was in the Jewish revolt that occurred between 66 and 72 A.D. The temple got destroyed in August, uh, August 9th, in fact, of 70 A.D. The Romans burned down the temple. So at that point, nobody could go to the temple. So that was a second stage in that distinction. But then the third stage occurred about 85 A.D., when the survivors of Jerusalem were from the Pharisee party. The Sadducees got wiped out in the destruction of the city. The Essenes were wiped out uh, in 68. But uh, the Pharisees survived, and they were led by Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai. And in 85 A.D., he and the Sanhedrin of the Pharisees decreed that the Christians could no longer be part of the synagogue. It was at that point that the Christians were excommunicated from the synagogue, and so that just had the split, you know, widen at that point, and they went, the, the two communities went their own ways. I have to go my own way uh, because we have run out of time. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your ways by his peace. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And, of course, uh, this network is brought to you by you. That's how our Lord inspired Mother Angelica to have it keep working. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And then we'll be able to pay all of our bills, too. Thank you, and God bless. <laughs>